She's British, she's British, okay? She's British. <laughs> but that's not weird. Alright, so we're talking about today about Don't Wish Singlehood. We're talking about the life of a British missionary named Gladys Alward, and I will be your narrator for today. <clears throat> she is a British hero. She's so famous, there's actually a movie made about her. You can look this up. Uh, some of you guys might know the actress Ingrid Bergman. No? No? Okay, she, Ingrid Bergman's like, like, you know, yeah. She's like an Oscar winning actress, like really famous. Maybe before your time. Uh, like, uh, uh, Casablanca. Uh, Casablanca. Casablanca, yeah. Um, so this is a movie actually about her life, in the end of the sixth happiness. This movie has some parts correct, um, has one major part incorrect, right? Um, and the glass hour herself, after she saw the movie, she's kind of like, uh... <clears throat> the major part that got incorrect is that in this movie, she has, she has love interest. When in real life, she had no love interest, all right? A big part of Gladys Hour's story is about her being single, which is why I bring her up tonight. All right, so the fact that the movie, because every movie, whenever there's a woman in a movie, they have to have a love interest, right, because Hollywood. So if you watch the movie, just remember that. The big part of her life was the fact that she was single, okay? She was a British hero. If you ask people in the UK about her, a lot of people knew about her. What's amazing about her, though, is that <clears throat> unlike many people who are, like, super educated or, like, super like, talented, da da What's amazing about her is that she actually wasn't talented. And that's what makes her story kind of so important. <clears throat> Let me set this up. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 and 34. All right, so we're talking about singleness. This is Paul speaking. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. As Paul writes to the church in Corinth, <laughs> He's, now he's talking about as Christians start, you know, growing, Christianity is growing in the Roman Empire, churches start growing and forming. How then should we think about marriage? All right, and this is actually important, right? Because if you think about it, <clears throat> even the different Christian, Christian traditions view marriage differently. So if you're a Catholic priest, can you get married? All right? Under certain you can. circumstances, you can. Under certain circumstances, you can. Just so you know, trivia-wise, that actually came out not because of theology. That actually came out because of politics. And I'll tell you that about that later. All right. But there is a major segment of people who read the Bible and tell all their clergy that they should not get married. Right? And they'll use stuff like this. I would like you to be free from concern and unmarried man to serve about the Lord's affairs. How we can please the Lord. So there is an aspect of that. There is an aspect of where you're a single person, <clears throat> your mind can be more focused on God. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. When you look at stuff like this, it's not so simple as if, oh, if you're single, then obviously you're focused on God. Or if you're, you know, if you're a, a Catholic priest and you're not married, you're obviously good to Pastor Jimmy. Pastor Jimmy has a wife and kids, so obviously he's not as holy. You never default into holiness. Okay? <laughs> I want to point something out today. You never default into holiness. Don't act as if, oh, because I am single, therefore I'm devoted to God. What Paul is actually saying here is that, <clears throat> just like by all things, we do all things by faith. In the Bible, Whenever God talks like this, if you're an unmarried woman, if you're an unmarried man, and if you're concerned about the Lord's affairs, you can only do that by faith, not by default. That's the key to the Christian life. Everything that we do is by faith. No, no, none of our devotion, none of the things that we do for God, compassion, kindness, if any of that is done without faith, it is worthless to God. So with that being said, if by faith you do this, your aim can be devoted to God in both body and spirit. You have the freedom to devote more of yourself to God. All right, I will tell you as a, as a, as a missionary, being married changed your life, right? <laughs> have, having a wife on the mission field changes how you do missions, right? Like, a lot of single people will be like, I don't care about martyrdom. Like, I'll be a martyr for Christ. And you have four toddlers, it's like not so easy to say that. So it changes your situation. But there's a freedom that happens in singlehood that I want to show you today through the life of God with Gladys Outward. Gladys Outward lived a life by faith, not by default, by faith that said, 
I now devote, because I am single and I have nothing holding me back, I devote myself to the Lord in every aspect of my life. All right? And the way she does it in her singlehood is something that I want, I want to show you guys and maybe it will inspire you guys. So, <clears throat> OMF has existed for 150 years. OMF stands for the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. It was called China in the, in, in the Mission during her time. Gladys Howard was one of those uh, old ladies in the church. Some of you guys might know some people like this. who are single, and they're like, always oh, the first one at church, you know, like sending cookies and stuff like that, water. And she's like that old lady who was like super loving and caring, right? One day she gets a call from God, even though in her whole old age, God is saying, go to the nations, go preach the gospel. So like a good Christian, she goes to the best mission organization, which is all that. <laughs> and she goes to the office and says, okay, I'm applying for OMF, I want to go to China. All right, and OMF's like, all right, well, before we send you over, we want to make sure that you can handle life in China because this is a tumultuous period, right? World War II, a bunch of countries are at war and it's going to be a crazy time. So not only is there political danger and like physical danger, but there's also the difficulty of learning a language and a culture and church planting and all that stuff. So like, when you, when you first go to a mission agency, you meet someone like me, who's a mobilizer, and then my predecessor, way back in the day, gave her a test. Testing her, how, how smart is she? Can she learn a language? Who here speaks Chinese? Look at you. Okay. So the rest of you know how hard Chinese is. <laughs> okay. Chinese is not an easy language to learn, especially if you're in the UK. So OMF gave her a test and basically said, you know, let's see your language acquisition skills. She had no college education, no higher education, and she, she, she failed miserably, right? She, she, was, she was a lo loving, hardworking person, but she wasn't educated. So then OMF sat down with her and says, you know what, we love your passion, your spirit, but honestly, like with, because of the fact that you're already old and you don't have education, we can't see you, right, like going to China, learn the language, and be an effective missionary. But she's like, you know what, I don't care, I wanna still do what I can to serve God. Well. A lot of mission agencies, we need people in the home office too. She's like, I'll do anything. They're like, well, your background is in housekeeping. Do you want to do housekeeping for the OMF office? And she's like, sure. That's the kind of person she was. So right off the bat, right off the bat, I want you to notice something. Even though her dream to China was stopped, she was humble enough just to do housekeeping for the OMF office. That's character. That's the kind of character that God can use. Right? I want to let you know that speaks highly of her. So what comes next in her life, right? The mobilizer at OMF is comfortable giving her because of her humility, because of her character. If you come to God as a proud person, if you come to God as a person who is somebody who is too able, sometimes God can't use you. Because if you succeed, it'll look like you did it. <laughs> right? It'll look like you did it. The world will look at your gifts and talents and be like, man, that person is awesome. That person went to UCSD, that person has a master's degree, that person has a PhD, that person is amazing. But when God uses a person like Gladys Alward, God gets the glory. Because she wasn't educated, right? Because she's already old. And because she has the humility to even do just housekeeping stuff, God can use it. So what happens next? <clears throat> OMF gets correspondence. There is an OMF missionary in the mountains uh, of China um, who was like 70 years old. And because you're 70, she's like, hey, I can't run this ministry forever. I need someone to replace me. So the ministry in the mountains of China was, um, this missionary was running an inn. It was an inn on, on, the, on a uh, road where a lot of miners pass when they go to like mine the mountains and stuff like that. And so she runs an inn where the miners would stop for the night, they would, they would have food at the inn, and then she would tell Bible stories. And so that, that was the ministry of this missionary. And so she was 70 years old, and she wrote back to the OMF home office and says, hey, I'm 70. Can you have someone to come help me out and maybe eventually take over this ministry, right? I don't know if you guys have ever run a hotel before. Hotel is mostly housekeeping. <laughs> okay, so the OMF, the OMF mobilizer is like, you know what, <clears throat> we will bless you to go to this place to be an assistant for this missionary in the, in the mountains. Um, you, have, you have to, like all of the missionaries, fundraise for your ticket and get out there. And, but she's old, right? And so she's like, I don't have that much time left. So she pretty much works and stays as much as she can, sells everything she has and packs it up and goes to China. Her travel is kind of funny and kind of irregular and it kind of shows the kind of person she is. 
Um, because she loses such a haste, because she's already old, and this lady's seven years old, um, she can't afford to buy food on the train and stuff like that during travel. So she packs her suitcases and stuff, which is like canned food and like pots and pans and all this stuff, right? So the way she travels is not like the way you and I travel, right? We're like, we'll just stop somewhere and eat. She like just packs up like all this food in cans and like pots and pans, and she, it's, it's like this weird scene, okay? Back in those days, how do you go from the UK to China? You can either take a boat or you can take rail, all right? And she actually takes rail. So she uses the Trans-Siberian Railroad and crosses over to the east. What is happening in the world during that time? All right, we get to talk about World War II and the events leading up to World War II. This is not the train she took. It's probably something older than this. <laughs> She takes the train out to the Siberian wilderness, which is like Russian area, and she's gonna go down eventually, right? But then there's fighting. So she gets to a certain point where the, where the soldiers start falling onto the train and say, you have to stop here, you have to, you have to go by foot the rest of the way, because there's too much fighting on the Eastern Front. So here's a single woman, and then she gets left in the Siberian, so this is the Siberian wilderness. I want you to imagine what the wilderness is like. And then she has to find her way from the Siberian wilderness all the way to China by herself. So maybe it's a good thing she packed all that food with her. Okay. This is the beginning of her journey. <clears throat> I think the moments in her life are important because God set it up so that she'd be ready for what was gonna, she was going to face in China. Reading her, her accounts of her story going through the Siberian wilderness, so she basically gets off the train, so there's a bunch of soldiers around her, so she already feels like in danger from the soldiers. She wanders into the wilderness, and she can actually hear wolves and stuff, like howling in the background. All right. And here's a person who has no language skills, all right, and who doesn't have the ability to have language skills because OMF, you know, recognized that she's not that great at learning language. But somehow she finds her way from Siberia all the way down to China. So then she eventually gets there. She eventually gets to, she eventually gets to, gets to China. She gets to the mountain, she finds the inn, and then she starts doing housekeeping for, for, this, whole, for this little inn, right, in China. At first, it's going, it's going really well. She starts learning some of the Bible stories that the, the missionary has been telling all the miners and stuff passing by. The innkeeper eventually passes away, and she takes over, over the, the hotel, or the inn. As she's doing that ministry, she kind of starts to want to expand and do more than that ministry. Right? Because the thing is, <clears throat> she's got, and you kind of tell so far behind her story, she's the kind of person where anything that she does, right, she does it with all her might, and she does it with all her heart. So of course, because she's an outstanding person, one day, an opportunity comes up. An opportunity comes up, one of the Chinese officials goes up to her and says, we have, we have an issue. We are trying to stop foot binding in China. Right, you guys know what foot binding is? Yeah. All right, so um, it was this practice where Chinese women like to have small feet, so they would bind the feet and break bones and stuff to have small feet. Well, the government tried to actually stop that because it was really cruel, right? It's cruel and, and unusual. And they wanted to stop it, and they, and they wanted someone to go around to inspect different villages, right, in the area, to make sure they weren't foot binding anymore. But then they couldn't do it because all the Chinese women themselves had like bound feet. It's like a bad message, right? You have a woman with bound feet, check out a woman with bound feet. But of course, she's British with big feet, <laughs> right? And so the government officials say, why don't you be, a, why don't you be the foot binder inspector, <laughs> all right? And she's like, well, I guess I'm a little white, white person, and so she ends up doing that. This is an important part of her story because as she goes out to inspect like all the different feet, right? When you travel on the countryside in China, again, the, the setting's important. During that time, because of political unrest and you know, World War II, all the, a war doesn't just pop out of nowhere, all right? Before a war starts, there's instability and all the crazy stuff happening. Um, she noticed that there were orphans all along the roads, right? There were orphans all along the roads. And then she passed by them and she's like, who's caring for these orphans? And people's all no one, right? The situation in most of the villages and stuff were so bad that there was just a bunch of children wandering out on the streets and no one could take care of them. And so the single person, she, she didn't have to ask for permission. She just started adopting the orphans. And, if, and as luck would have it, she had an inn where she could house all the orphans, right? <coughs> and so throughout, throughout her journey, she starts just collecting all these street children, right? And raising them as her own, right? Eventually, I think she herself had like 30 orphans that she housed at her inn, and I think 100 more that she knew about in her, in her town. Acts 20, 24. 
I consider my life worth nothing to me. Because my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. What causes a woman to do this kind of thing? To go from the world she knows, who spent most of her life in, and she's grown old in that world, to the Mount Reasons of China, to run an inn, right, filled with basic street children that she found. This. I consider my life worth nothing to me. Her ambitions are only about God. She has no ambitions of wealth, of fame, of accolades from others. My life is worth nothing to me. My only aim, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. She went to the OMF office originally to say, I want to be a missionary in China. OMF tells her no. She's like, fine, I'll be a housekeeper. That's fine. Whatever God puts in front of me, I'll do it. If God calls me to be a housekeeper and all I am is a maid, I'll be a maid. Gladys, we're asking you to go to, to China to, to be housekeeping at an inn. I'll do that. The task that before me, I'll complete that task. Jesus has given me, I'll do it with all my might. Gladys, we, have, uh, we see a bunch, there's a bunch of orphans. Who's going to take care of them? I'll take care of them. Because, because the way Jesus cared for the children, Jesus let the children come to me. If that's the case, then I'm gonna, if I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm going to do the exact same thing. Because what she's doing, she's testifying to the good news of God's grace. There's a lot of things we can do in our life, right? A lot of words we can talk at people about the love of God, the grace of God. And what grace means is grace is getting something you don't deserve. So these children on, you know, on, the, on the roads to the villages, they don't deserve to have, a, to have a house. They don't deserve to live somewhere, to have food every day, to have someone love them. So the fact that she goes out and does this for them, kids that are not her own, that by definition is grace. It's not her grace, it's the grace of God. How, do, how does she declare the, the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ when her language skills aren't that great? By the way she lives. By the way she lives. You don't have to have perfect Chinese. All right, a lot of my coworkers in OMAP, they're Chinese. Some of them are really good Chinese, some of them are kind of terrible Chinese. All right? You don't have to be super smart. You don't have to have great eloquence what you have to do is you have to live out the life that says, my life is worth nothing to me. My only desire is to finish the race, complete the task Jesus has given me. And if you do that, people will see the grace of God in your life. There's a way you can do housekeeping for the glory of God. You can housekeep for the glory of God so excellently that people will ask you to do other government duties, right? Like expecting feet, which is a great and glorious job. <laughs> All right? And when God sees he can trust you with that, he can trust you with 30 orphans. Testify to the good news of God's grace. Right? That's the promise you have. If you, by faith, use your singlehood for God, let that be said of your life. Right? There's a lot of things you can be praised for in your life. Oh man, you have a big house. Oh man, you're so smart. Oh man, you're talented. You're good at music. You're good at sports. You're good at that. Let this be said about your life. That your life was about finishing the race, completing the task that God has given you, and that your life testified the good news of God's grace. But here's the thing: if that's if all she did was house orphans, how, how, why is she a hero? Right? How did how did everyone in the UK know about her? <clears throat> Remember, she was faithful in being a housekeeper. She ran into the trials of the Siberian wilderness, and she was faithful in running an inn. Right? In the mountainous regions. If you're faithful with little, God will give you much. So here, here's what's next in her story, which is crazy. This is, a, this, is a, this is a picture of her wearing the Chinese stuff, and that's one of the little kids. The Japanese attack China. The Japanese attack China, and, Ch and a lot of villages have to evacuate. All right? Um, if you guys. If you guys ever looked at the World War II campaigns or something like that, if you looked at how Japanese eventually invaded China, the northern regions are less occupied, whereas there are more forces to the south, and especially near Hong Kong, where the British forces are. And so what Chinese try to do is... Nanking? Huh? Where was Nanking? Nanking's towards the south, too. Yeah. I mean, 
basically, the most fortified areas are going to be Shanghai, Guangzhou, something like that. But eventually, all, all, the, all, all the areas of China eventually fall. But everyone has to get to Hong Kong to be protected by the British and try to get out. So, <clears throat> everyone in the mountainous regions try to flee to Hong Kong. All right. I, know you, I don't know if you guys have ever been part of an evacuation or seen an evacuation. It's like every, one, every man and woman for themselves. All right. While this is happening, all right, the Japanese don't invade like you know slowly. They start like blitzing, blitzing in, right? So villages and villages start falling, all right? And Japanese have airplanes and stuff like that too. So by the time the Japanese get to them, all right, a lot of the a lot of the um, cities and villages between them and Hong Kong, which is their escape port, are already occupied by the Japanese. And then a lot of the families are on a rush of their own. But she herself is now in, ki 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 in the care of a hundred orphans. What makes her a hero is that without the help of any military strategists from America or Chinese strategists, because no one cares about orphans, all right? I don't know if you guys knew that. No one ever cares about orphans. She takes 100 orphans herself all the way to the port of Hong Kong. When you, when you read her account about what she does, she basically, with, and she, again, maybe she's an old lady, okay? She's not a soldier. She sets up, like, you know, some of the, some of the children to, like, stay up at night to watch to make sure the Japanese soldiers aren't coming, right? She travels during the times where, like, you know, there's like no guard patrols, and then, and, the, and I don't know if you're talking with kids. Kids are crazy. <laughs> and so even though they're at war, these kids are still like acting bad and like doing kids things. And somehow she gets a hundred orphans, all from the mountains of China, all the way to the port of Hong Kong. And then when she shows up, and the movie does a great job of this, the, she shows up to the city, people like. Who are you? How'd you get here? It's like, well, I run it in in the mountains, and I brought all these children here, right? And they're like, how did you get past off Japanese lines? Like, oh no, we just travel at night and avoid patrols and stuff like that. <clears throat> That's what made her famous. But I, I wanted you, I wanted you to know the stories of her before that, right? There will be moments in your life where you have an opportunity to do amazing things, heroic, awesome deeds. All right, this is an, I think this is an awesome deed. This is kind of crazy. Right, she's like running from like Japanese bombers and stuff. But the life you live up to that moment, what is it? Right, and this is why it applies to you young adults. Right, housekeeping, being a maid. It's the humble things in life first. That's that's the benefit you have as a single, single person. Build your character now. Build your character now. Because one day, and you, you, I mean, if I tell you right now, I want you to rescue 100 orphans, take them to Hong Kong, to, and escape Japanese occupation, right? You're like, that's impossible. It is impossible because you're not that person yet. Because you're not that kind of person yet. What God did in her life was over time, God made her that person. Right? Because think about her life already. She's already been alone in the Siberian wilderness. She's already traveled the roads of the mountain regions of China by herself already. And she's already cared for tens and tens of orphans already. Right? So when the Japanese invaded, she was already ready. That's the stage you're in like, that's the stage you are in right now is that first stage of housekeeping. Will you be faithful with the small things in life first? Are you humble enough with your education, your talents, and all that stuff to say, God, use me however you want. Use me as a maid. We struggle sometimes so much against our condition, right? We struggle so much in like, oh, I don't want to be single. I'm going to fight and fight my way out of being single. Like, oh, I don't want to be poor. I'm going to fight my way out of being poor. Or I don't want to be like, you know, housekeeper. I'm going to fight my way out of this terrible job. What encouraged me about the life of Gladys Howard is that whatever God placed in her life, she did it faithfully. And God built each of those moments up to make her the kind of person that can, that can rescue 100 people. Orphans taking out of Hong Kong. Alright? So when that pressure came, that challenge came, she was the kind of person who could overcome it. So that's that's a challenge for you guys tonight. You're single. Alright, you have that freedom. It's kind of funny because if she had a husband, I, I can't the Carmen came home one day, he's like, hey, here's 30 kids. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not down with that. <laughs> Yeah, that's, as any married couple, they're, they're not down with that. All right. <laughs> there's a freedom you have in your life right now, right? There's a, there's a freedom to do housekeeping in your life that you have right now. Embrace that. Here's some small group questions for you guys. 
more part about the story and life stood out to you. All right, some of you guys give you guys a lot to work with. So in your small groups, talk about that. What part of that story stood out to you? What is a God glorifying advantage of being single? All right, you guys can think of some different things. What's an advantage of being single? And what are some ways you can serve as a single person that you might not be able to do later? All right, house 30 orphans is one of them. That's for free. All right, let me pray. I'll bring you guys to small groups. Father God, I thank you for the people that you have raised up before us, who have gone out before us and have given us an example of what it means to follow you. Lord, I pray that you would give us the same spirit that you gave them, the same courage, the same faith that you gave them. God, give us humility, give us character, give us a passion and a love for your grace and your mercy, and help us to be able to speak of that and share openly in our small groups. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Find a small group. You're gonna sign up? Yeah. Um, I think this could be. We have 